Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I would just like to mention our brief disclaimer here and that this information is provided in this webinar is presented in good faith, but uh, we provide no warranty for those who may be futures trading on this information or making other business decisions and that those should be done in conjunction with con consultation of their expert uh, advisors. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Chris Wolf. He's a presenter in the Dyson, a professor rather, in the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University, where he has been since 2019. Prior to that, he was a professor of ag, um, applied economics at Michigan State University. He holds a bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin Madison and a PhD from the University of California Davis. Um, we look forward to Chris's presentation today, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris to share his screen. But, uh, oh, not now. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, having me here today, and uh, happy to talk a little bit about the dairy market uh, situation and outlook. Um, going to be an interesting year. Seems like it's always an interesting year in dairy, but this next one is going to be particularly interesting, and let's talk a little bit about that. I'll tell you what, I'm having issues with my slides today. There we go. Did the slide change there, Kyle? <clears throat> okay. okay. So what I thought I would do is start with a little review of 2020, because I think uh, a lot of where we're going to be going depends on where we're coming from, more so this year than in previous years. So I'll talk a little bit about the supply and the demand and the policy issues that uh, sprung up uh, in 2020. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the outlook. So we came into 2020, you might recall, looking at a projected good farm milk price year for the first time really since 2014. I mean, there had been some individual farms that had had okay years in between, but the industry as a whole it had been real tough for the previous five years. And so it was kind of refreshing to talk about the possibility of having a good year in 2020. The world dairy markets seemed fairly well balanced. We seem to be at the end of some of the trade issues that have been going on. Um, and, you know, it looked like we were maybe going to get back into China, that uh, we were going to finish up some of those trade disputes and that um, markets were going to be uh, fairly healthy and we were looking at the possibility of you know averaging $18 for class 3 milk which primarily drives the overall milk price in this country which is milk for cheese and, and you know possibly having farm milk prices that could have been you know in some places 19 20 bucks then of course COVID-19 comes in in March and really hits home in April in this country and necessitated really major adjustments in terms of readjusting the dairy supply chain as the food away from home was effectively shut down in many locations at least temporarily and then when it came back it came back with a lot of extra effort and um, a lot of extra expenses and difficulties and so let's kind of talk about that so you can see this is uh, let me just briefly talk about the general economy uh, um, issues a bit we had been humming along at three and a half, four percent unemployment, which was historically low uh, unemployment rates uh, until April, obviously, when we had a massive spike to 14 and a half, almost 15 percent. So the highest unemployment rate that had been recorded um, since the Great Depression. And the Great Depression didn't happen in one month like that. And that was 23 million jobs that were lost there um, in a month. And we've since then been recovering fairly methodically, kind of leveled off recently though. Um, and we're still down 11 million jobs. And actually, um, it'll be interesting to see the next monthly report because last week was a big slug of uh, uh, about a million or so new unemployment claims. So that's going to, you know, we might actually see uh, unemployment rate tick up a bit. It kind of depends on participation rates. But so nonetheless, you know, 
uh, is a high unemployment rate, certainly much higher than we'd like to see. But that kind of masks the fact that a lot of people have kind of stepped out of the workforce in the sense that they're not looking anymore. And so, you know, we're still down 11 or more million jobs. And that means that there's a lot of buying power that's gone with that, right? And of course, it's not hitting evenly. It's, you know, uh, people that work in jobs where they can work remotely, and I'm fortunate to be in one of those jobs and I'm grateful for it, um, haven't really had the an impact in the in right like the people that can't work remotely and aren't kind of essential workers um those people that don't meet either one of those criteria are, are really getting hammered in this situation and just for perspective because i thought this was an interesting graph here's all of the recessions that have happened since world war ii in terms of percent job loss and um number of months after peak employment they're kind of you can see that 2000, um, 2007, 2008, when we had the that what we called the Great Recession there, because um, that that caused a big decline in jobs that took many many years to come back, about six and a half years to get all those jobs back. It was really slow going. This recession we're looking at, you know, losing almost 15 percent, but spiking right back up. And then the last month or so kind of leveling off and possibly getting worse. So that's certainly a V recovery, which is what we'd like to see. Um, much more of a V recovery than you know anyone that we'd seen, at least in percentage terms. But we want to get past COVID and get that back up to where we can be full employment and have a roaring economy again. And then looking at personal consumption expenditures and Consumption is two thirds of, of GDP in this country. You can see that the decline there from, from where it really started going down in February at the high point to the low point in April was a, almost a 20% almost a decline in personal consumption expenditures that then bounced back up and then has kind of plateaued. So we're certainly off of trend. Um, I think American businesses have done a good job of trying to figure out workarounds, um, you know, not do business face-to-face, -face, do um, uh, contactless pickup where they can, do takeout, do things like that, but there's only so much of that you can do before, you know, kind of run out of options. And, and the other thing that's happened here with this, not, with this recovery is once we got to the point where in the Northern climates, you couldn't eat outside easily, that certainly uh, hurts restaurants that were working in that way now this has direct implications for agriculture and food um, this is food expenditures just to show you kind of what happened for total food sales and then food away from home versus food at home so this is percent change from a year earlier we have food away from home dropping 26 percent in march over a year earlier almost 50 percent in april 35 percent in may um, and you know, and then kind of leveling off at the 15 to 20 percent in the last few months. That being offset by a spike there of 20 percent in March, which is when we saw the supermarket shelves kind of be empty in some places and lots of people um, buying, you know, changing their buying habits because they're consuming all their meals at home. And since then, the food at home sales have been up, but not enough to offset the expenditures on food away from home. And one thing to keep in mind here. Is the food away from home expenditures includes um, taxes and tips that the food at home does not include. So you know part of that is uh, lost wages for the people that work in in the retail food establishments, and so that we're we're not spending that money, but they also aren't getting that as income. And you know similar in story with uh, food service and drinking places. You can see the drop uh, of uh, more than fifty percent in sales there. Supermarket foot traffic spiked in uh, the middle of March over a year earlier um, compared to 2019 and since then has been below. Um, so we're eating at home, but we're going to the supermarket less um, for a good reason because we're trying to minimize contact maybe. And also there's just certain populations of people that are avoiding going out altogether because of health concerns. Um, sit down restaurant foot traffic drops well below 50% of what it had been the year earlier, 
in March and has recovered a little bit. It kind of depends on where you live. And then number of employees for food services and drinking places, you can see a 50% decline in April over a year earlier, and then still 20% below where they had been. So some recovery, but not completely. And this has led to you know, bankruptcies of lots of restaurants, um, many of which will probably not be back, which is very sad. Um, and in fact, you know, disproportionately sit down restaurants that are that have just not been able to make it work because they, they can't cover variable costs. So there's no sense in being open or they're maybe not allowed to be open. And so the way we've gotten around all of this is that we're we're done a lot more um, food delivery. So this is meal delivery services, uh, monthly sales. Um, and they're up about 500%, 500 to 550%. Um, and you can see where it is, it's Uber Eats and Grubhub and DoorDash and other things of that nature. So that's how we get around not going out to the supermarket as much, even though we're doing all of our eating at home, is uh, everybody now has a delivery service. Um, this is, uh, sorry, I should have labeled this. This is the consumer price index. Um, and it goes back to 2000 because that was the default. So basically consumer price index where we finished the year was 1.4% above a year earlier. So that would be the inflation rate uh, for all items. So not a lot of inflation, a little bit of inflation. And the reason I put that in there is if you look at for food specifically, whoops, hold on. Food at home is uh, up significantly more than that almost four percent and then food away from home about four percent also is where we finished the year but a little bit different patterns and it's kind of hidden at the end of this the food at home prices spiked pretty dramatically in the middle of the year when we saw things like plant closures for the meat processing plants and other things like that um, we had a situation where uh, you know beef prices at the farm were low uh, and beef prices at the consumer were high, and it was because we were rationing, you know, kill space to, to be open because there were so many uh, health uh, events going on in some of these meat processing plants. So it spiked up and then has actually come down a little bit as these supply chains have kind of adjusted and figured out how to operate in the COVID world. So it had been much higher in kind of, you know, late summer, and now it has come down to 3.9%. 3.8% and food away from home on the other hand has has been rising kind of since the middle of the year uh, and, and kind of ends up at about the same point and, and the point there is you so that means the food uh, prices uh, have gone up um, two and a half to three times as much as the general price increase um, in the economy this last year and I think uh, to be fair a lot of that has to do with the increased cost of doing business in a COVID world, as far as um, cleaning, as far as um, you know, having to take care of your employees the right way and to meet the customer um, maybe in different ways than you met them before. So you know, uh, I get some questions about you know, is this price gouging? And um, you know, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, but the, but I think a longer answer is we would have to look at how much the cost of doing business has changed all the way from the input level through the farms, through processing and retailing because of COVID. And it's not necessarily unreasonable to think that a lot of this uh, price increase has to do with the increased uh, cost of doing business in the world that we see right now. So, but thinking specifically getting back to the dairy markets, um, there's been some interesting trends that have happened under COVID. And these are the ones that have some implications kind of for maybe possibly going uh, forward in the dairy industry as well as what we've been living with. One is the package sizes up for many products um, then that because we're eating at home instead of out. So I mean package size that are being sold at the grocery store. Now in, in package sizes down in the food service in the sense that um, it's you know it's harder to go through five gallons of 
sour cream if you're a restaurant if you're just not having people come through so when i say package sizes up i'm really mean it in grocery stores uh, butter and cream consumption on the whole is up even though butter consumption at home is sorry it's down even though butter consumption at home is up so when people eat away from home when americans eat away from home food away from home when they go out to eat they tend to eat more butter and cream than they would when they cook at home um you know we've increased our consumption of butter at home but it hasn't been enough to offset the lost butter and cream consumption um, of what we would have eaten if we'd gone out uh, processed cheese consumption is up after having been down for many years. Uh, Velveeta, uh, cheese whiz, things of that nature, macaroni and cheese, the cheese that they use for macaroni and cheese is up. So comfort food, eating at home has led to more processed cheese consumption when that really had been declining rather significantly in recent years. Um, yogurt is part of the package size story. Large container sales of yogurt are up, but the small six pack sales are down. Uh, so this is, you know, there's no need to grab a yogurt on your way out the door to eat either on the commute or at work if you're not going to work. So that has led to, you know, more sales of the, of the bigger size, uh, but less of the small ones. The other thing um, as part of that story is that a lot of manufacturers because they need more shelf space, have cut back the number of products that they're carrying. The, the, num the number of SKUs that are in the, in the grocery stores is down significantly, most places. Um, they just need more space for the basics because they're selling more of the basics. Um, and in dairy, one of the things that's happening is you uh, some companies have cut back on the number of, say, flavors of yogurt that they're producing. So they, you know, they instead of having 25 flavors of yogurt, maybe they have 12 now because they're kind of, um, well, first of all, there's been getting some of the things that they include has been difficult. But the other thing is, it's just, uh, it preserves the shelf space that they need for the products that they're selling a lot more of. And so one thing that will be interesting to watch will be to see whether these grocery stores go back to this, the same kind of variety of selections of all these products after this pandemic or if this is more of a permanent change to have uh, a little bit less variety but bigger quantities of it then you don't have to worry as much about running out of the basics and then the other thing is the the growth on the fluid milk side at the retail level has been in extended shelf life and organic products more heavily than it has been in other products On the supply side, the milk supply response in 2020 with this sudden loss of food service outlets um, necessitated a change in the product mix. Um, some milk was dumped in the short term and some of it was transported long distances and sold at distressed prices. Uh, this is milk dumping in all orders. So this is all orders across the country going back for 20 years. Um, and you know there was no need for me to put 20 years in there except to point out a couple different things. This is in millions of pounds of milk, and we you know produce 220 billion pounds of milk roughly in 2020. So that gives you some idea of the order of magnitude. We're talking about you know 0.2 percent or or less of milk dumped on average. There's always a little bit of milk dumped because of logistical issues, because um, you know a truck breaks down or because a plant has to go down for some maintenance or something like that. But when we got to um, April of, and there had been more milk dumping, by the way, in the previous five years, and that has to do with um, milk production growth outstripping processing capacity in, in many regions of the country, including the Northeast, uh, as one of the main areas where that had been occurring seasonally, which is why you see kind of that up and down the seasonality. Um, but April of 2020, we dumped 349 million pounds of milk, which was quite high, the highest that we had recorded, but it went quickly back down to normal levels. This is the Northeast order. Of that 349 million pounds of milk that was dumped, 131 million pounds of it was in the Northeast order. And I think that part of that just has to do with the fact that the Northeast order has uh, a very a kind of a unique mix of, of milk uses as far as you know you're looking at 
uh, a lot of beverage milk that gets consumed by the population on the eastern seaboard. That's part of the northeast order. But you also have uh, and, and school children that that went away that consumption. But you also have you know this air, this part of the country produces the most cottage cheese, the most sour cream, the most cream cheese, and all of those products were heavily affected by that move from food away from home to food at home. So 131 million pounds out of the 349, so more than a third of the milk that was dumped was in the Northeast order. Um, and then if we look at that in percentage terms though, the Northeast dumped 5% uh, of the milk that was uh, produced in the month of April, which again was the highest amount in quantity by far, but Florida actually dumped a higher percentage of milk when they dumped uh, 14%. And there were a couple of orders that dumped it. So while we dumped the most milk in this part of the country, it wasn't the highest percentage. Co-ops also, in response to trying to get the milk production right size in the short term, uh, either introduced or activated um, supply management type programs that they had that, um, you know, I'm going to call base programs where they set the farm's uh, amount of milk that they could market without any penalty at some historical percentage that they had produced before, like say maybe 80, somewhere between 85 and 95% of their March 2020 milk production level. And any milk that was marketed in excess of that would receive a lower price either because they had to pay excessive marketing costs or because they just put in a fixed adjustment there. And that resulted in um, the farm milk production adjusting rather quickly. So then what we ended up with for, for 2020 on the farm milk price side, and we're starting to get some idea as you guys are also at, at Farm Credit, when you're starting to look at your business summaries for 2020, um, I think what we're gonna find and what we've been seeing so far is that the farm milk price, and then the, in, in, which is highly correlated with net farm income on these farms, varies widely depending on location, cooperative and processor issues. Um, and in some cases is lower than the, the average class three price or in many cases because of the timing, the deep pooling and the spread between class three and class four prices. And so what we end up with dairy farm income is it seems to depend very highly on government payments as far as, which is correlated with farm size to some extent because um, the CFAT payments, which is coronavirus food assistance payments were based on the milk that you sold Dairy margin coverage less so because that really applies more to smaller herds. So, did you get signed up for the payments? And if so, uh, a herd that had multiple entities, multiple families as part of it, could re would hit the would not hit the uh, payment limits like a herd with one family would. So everything else equal, uh, you know, the herd that had two or three partners might have received higher payments there. The second thing is risk management activities. Uh, there was, uh, you know, some farms that had contracts coming into the year in particular on dairy revenue protection, and some of those, uh, you know, did a good job and uh, as far as offering some protection there, uh, and that also depended on whether it was class three or class four and what the mix was there, because class four prices simply didn't recover like class three did, and it turned out to have been a better year to have some uh, the revenue protection contracts in some ways in class four. And then also where the milk was shipped, um, how the co-ops ended up re-blending, any excess costs they had varied, and their ability to kind of do so depended on what contracts they had, as far as whether they had fluid milk contracts or whether they had to end up sending a lot of milk a long ways away to find a home, things of that nature. So really seeing a wide range in kind of uh, how the farms did for 2020. Um, going to be some haves and some have-nots and some farms are going to end up with a lot of money in government payments and in risk ma risk management activities and they're going to 2020 is going to have been a good year um, I was talking to somebody from uh, John Deere recently and they indicated that they were selling out of uh, some pieces of equipment uh, that there was just no inventory because farmers um, were purchasing a lot 
So the government programs that were part of that response then were the dairy margin coverage program and dairy revenue protection, which I just talked about, and then direct payments from the coronavirus food assistance program. If you look at the U.S. as a whole, the all milk price was uh, was solid. I mean, Q2 was low, uh, 15, you know, 15 and a half bucks, but the rest of the year was eight, 19 dollars or more um, with the net DMC payment in Q2 if you could get it. On, on your milk production of 240 for that quarter and CFAP payments that average two dollars and about two dollars and fifty cents across the entire year so that if you got all of those payments you could have potentially had a tremendous year um, not very many farms got all of that but it certainly was possible if we look at then U.S. agriculture as a whole you probably you know noticed this that something on the order of 40 percent of net farm income uh, for 2020 is projected to come from government payments. That's across agriculture as a whole. You can see in this graph here, you know, the 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 orange value there in 2020 is a very big number. Um, and then the yellow one is the market facilitation payments, which was the payments as part of that kind of whole trade war deal that kind of faded out in, in from 2019 to 2020. Hopefully we're done with. But still, big amounts of government payments. The other side uh, of what government did in 2020 was to have an, had an indirect effect on dairy in the sense that the food assistance programs purchased dairy products, which ended up buoying demand and replacing some of the loss in sales from the food away from home. So SNAP, which is um, food stamps, Benefits increased a great deal, as did the emergency food assistance program. And then there was the coronavirus food assistance program, which was called the Farmers Farm Families to Farmers to Families Food Box uh, program. And you can see four rounds in 2020. They recently announced a fifth round for 2021. Um, the total is between five and five and a half billion dollars total spent on the food box program, 20% of which. Um, basically, it was to be spent on dairy. Um, if we look at it's a little bit hard to figure out how big of an impact the food box program had because they they had some idea of what they purchased because they kind of roughly defined these boxes that then got distributed to needy families through food banks and uh, soup kitchens and other outlets. But the the product mix varied a little bit by over time and by area so but the best estimate that i can get from ams is that uh, on a milk fat basis the um over the final three quarters which is when it operated the food box purchased about just shy of one percent of the um, <clears throat> u.s total butter fat production for the year uh which is actually quite a lot when you consider kind of how inelastic these markets are and about half a percent of the, of the solids not fat um and part of the reason that they produced more purchased more on a milk fat basis is because these food boxes required uh, whole milk in a lot of cases and so a box would contain a gallon of whole milk and a pound of butter and possibly some cheese yogurt things of that nature but it was definitely a lot of butter and, and whole milk purchased so that was a big contributor to propping up demand in 2020 and if we look at it broken out a little bit more here, um, the gray area would be the food box. Um, and you can see that, um, that the food, the gray purchases of butter really ramped up um, in the last two quarters of the um, 2020 year. And trade mitigation also mattered, but the result is about 1% of butter. And, um, and then this is not, then on the cheese side, we actually consistently have more government purchases over time. But we had uh, cheese purchases um, that were about 1.5% of the cheese produced, but greater than half of that was for schools. So that was not ne necessarily a direct response to, to uh, coronavirus at all. We consistently buy a lot of cheese products for schools, but we don't actually consistently buy butter for schools. In fact, um, as you know, whole milk in schools uh, doesn't work because of the calorie limits that are placed on on the meals and similarly they schools don't tend to use butter uh, in their meals either for the same reason so this 
really was a big ramp up of butter purchases compared to what we normally would see the government do. And it was an increase in cheese, but not nearly to the same order. Um, so both of those cropped up demand. Um, U.S., New Zealand, European Union milk prices last month available is November. U.S. is in red. These are in dollar. Sorry, these are in euros per hundred kilogram. So you'd have to divide it by like uh, 2.1 something to get down to where we're talking about. It's also 4.2 percent fat. But the point here is that if you look at where we're at on farm milk prices at the current time, on average now, so not specific to the Northeast, uh, we're well above where New Zealand and the European Union are in farm milk prices. So moving forward, unless there's reasons to think that we're going to keep those prices propped up, maybe with government purchases or other specific um, factors, there's going to be some downward pressure on U.S. milk prices. Um, well, I guess the other option is those other two prices tend to come up, but that seems less likely, kind of depending. This is a milk production change from prior year, top four suppliers, the U.S. is in red. You can see that milk production has been growing for the past couple of uh, months that's on there, as has the European Union. That's a few months old though, it's the most recent one we have. But if we get more specific to the U.S., More specific to the U.S., average daily U.S. milk production dropped there in May, you can see, but has been strongly up in, in recent months to finish the year. In fact, well above trend in September, October, November from where it had been. Strong milk production. These high prices um, and government payments based on production have not you know, sent a signal to cut back milk production at all. And so we've you know, been kind of gathering steam on milk production. If you look at it, this is, so this was um, average daily U.S. milk production. This is percent change over a year earlier. Um, the long run trend in percent change in milk production would be about 1.7%. So if you're above 1.7, you're kind of above trend. We started off the year strong with it being almost 3% over in March, which was very strong. Um, a big drop in April and May to the point where we were actually half a percent below a year earlier in May, and then since then recovering back up to that 3% level, um, which would be quite bullish, actually, if we're looking at outlook. The dairy cow numbers, kind of a similar story, a little bit less extreme, um, because you can see the axis on the left is not a big range. But still, we culled some cows, culled fairly heavily till about uh, early summer. And since then, we've kind of been building the herd back up. Um, net, we're up about 80,000 cows, um, 80, 85,000 cows in the country, which is not a huge change. It's, so mostly it's been um, milk per cow where we've seen uh, the biggest change. And so then this is milk per cow per day, uh, which has grown very strongly in September, October, November. And importantly, also, because we've had high butterfat prices for the last few years, and a lot of producers have uh, changed their nutrition programs and in some cases their genetics to breed more for butter. We had an average butter fat test for the whole country of over 4%, 4.05% uh, butter fat in milk in November, which was the highest test on average we've ever had. So we have, uh, you know, kind of achieved that big supply response that had been building in butter fat production. Um, and actually we've been building stocks, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, US exports are up in 2020, both in terms of volume and value. 2020 has been a good year. Um, if we look at where we're sending the exports, we export a whole lot of powder. In fact, we export more than half of our non-fat dry milk, skim milk powder. Uh, these are three biggest destinations where Southeast Asia is actually a group of countries. Um, and it's interesting to me here that Mexico um, has kind of been down. In fact, not kind of, they've been down. They peaked in 2018, the amount that they purchased from us, and it's been down in 2019 and, and down even further in 2020. Uh, that's reflecting two different factors. One is the kind of trade war issues that we had um, 
into Mexico. But the other thing is the Mexican economy is not doing well. Mexico is having, um, in many ways, a bigger struggle with COVID than we are. And um, they don't have the purchasing power. Um, their currency is much weaker versus the US dollar. And it's um, that's something to watch if you're the US dairy industry, because Mexico is far and away the biggest destination of US um, exports. Although, um, <clears throat> you know more we really depend on them on the cheese side uh, a great deal which i'm not going to get into for whey products um so the other thing is um, that china's up a bit here for non-fat dry milk skim milk powder um after being down in 2018 2019 it's a little bit hard to see because they uh, do a lot less than the other two destinations on whey products which is we're thinking mostly of whey protein concentrates here um you can see that china had been importing a whole lot of whey um, into 2017 and then 2018 and 2019, partly in response to trade war issues, but also partly in response to African swine flu, which knocked out a large portion of their swine herd um, where they feed a lot of whey for protein. Uh, the Chinese imports of US whey were down dramatically in 2018 and 2019 and then have recovered significantly in 2020, which is good news. Um, meanwhile, Southeast Asia also up and Mexico down. So kind of the same story. Um, Asia and China in particular have been increasingly important trading partners here this last year. And hopefully that kind of trend continues uh, because we need to make up for some issues in Mexico. Although the other thing that would be great is if Mexico kind of recovered themselves. So looking at ending stocks of American cheese, um, <clears throat> By month, you can see that we are not heavy on cheese. Uh, this is part of what's been holding the class three price up is um, we've been kind of shortish, especially on fresh cheese. Um, dry whey, also down, that goes with cheese. Um, ending, ending stocks of butter, on the other hand, are high. It's a little bit hard to tell here. because you, I mean, you can see it's well above the previous three years, which is in the red line, but it's a little bit hard to tell Kind of how much but it's significant we we have the largest amount of butter and cold storage at this point in the year that we've had in 27 28 years now so we have a lot of butter a lot of butter got made in fact um you know when we kind of went uh, into april with covid the butter production spiked to 25 percent over what it had been in april of 2019 and that's kind of how we balanced the markets was operated the butter churns. And so we've, you know, put a lot of butter into storage and hopefully we're gonna, you know, be able to export that competitively under the markets. Um, or, but, but these butter stocks is what's overhanging class four right now. So, you know, we don't have high cheese stocks. Class three has been strong because that market's tight. We got a lot of butter and that's kind of um, keeping class four low. And that's driving this difference between class three and class four price, which is also trickling through and causing things like a negative PPD on producers checks, which they're very unhappy about. I'm sure you've probably heard. Um, just this is the WASDE report, this last uh, outlook. They're projecting for 2021 about a trend increase in milk production. I think that's probably a little low. Um, they're projecting a pretty big increase in, in fat basis exports, 5.4%. Uh, That's pretty optimistic. Hopefully they're right. Um, skim solids exports, 3% increase. That would be nice also. Um, but you think about it, if they're going to end up with, if, if we're looking at possibly a much higher than that milk production increase, and maybe exports not growing that much, then that would be both of which would be bearish on the outlook, their outlook uh, is for class three prices of about 17 bucks, class four prices of about 14, and an all milk of 17.65. All of that would be kind of long run average type prices. Um, I would be, I mean, everything else equal with what I've said so far, I'd probably be a little more bearish than that. Um, here's where the futures market closed last night, uh, 16 bucks in January for class three up near 18, although it's been kind of trailing off into March and then sitting around 1750 for the rest of the year. That would be reasonably consistent, a little bit higher than what USDA was forecasting. 
Um, but the class four prices here on average would probably would be significantly higher than USDA's forecasting, starting out about 14 bucks and ending up about 17. In the long run, we're going to see that class three and class four have kind of got to converge um, a little more. And, and a couple things are happening on that front. Uh, one is a couple new cheese processing facilities that we're going to make significantly more cheddar cheese this next year than we did last year with a very big plant opening in Michigan and more capacity opening a little further out west, like on the I-29 corridor. So more fresh cheese production is gonna bring that class three price down a little bit, more all else equal. Um, and that would be good in a way, but it would be even better if class four prices just recovered to meet it. Um, cheddar cheese prices have been very high. Lately, they've been kind of trailing off. Um, you can, and butter prices has been a bit of a roller coaster, but they're well below what they had been the previous few years. If we look at um, where the mercantile exchange is, class three, class four, we had kind of been building some momentum. Uh, that big jump at the beginning of January in the red line had to do with the USDA um, announcing that round five of the food box purchases of an additional $1.5 billion, uh, where they're buying cheese uh, as part of those food boxes, and they gave a lot of um increased demand there as far as the market was concerned if we look at the dairy forecast margin which would be the dairy margin coverage program you can see that the forecasted margin at the current time is supposed to drop well off from where we started the year at almost 12 dollars uh, income over feed cost all the way down to below eight and staying in that eight eight fifty range for most of the year that's been almost entirely driven by increased in feed, pr feed prices this last uh, couple months where we've had some drought issues in South America and increased demand for US grains, um, corn and soybeans into Asia. So that you know we've been looking at the potential for $5 corn and $15 beans, um, which if that happens is going to definitely mean that we're gonna see some higher dairy margin coverage um, payments this next year also makes you wonder if you're a dairy producer if you you shouldn't maybe also consider the um, um, dairy livestock gross margin contract although all, all other things equal I think the dairy revenue protection is a much better contract it just doesn't account for the feed cost and the probability of a net benefit under the dairy margin coverage program is basically 100 percent if you purchased it at 950 which virtually everybody hopefully did um, then just to finish up here, here's this is what I'm kind of watching, and I, I think this is going to determine, um, you know, how good this year is. You always have a problem when you talk to an economist that the answer is it depends, okay? Um, and you know that's just kind of the way it is, um, because right now we're looking at feed costs at a multi-year high. Um, so we're going to be watching acres planted. We're going to be watching weather both here and in South America. We're gonna be watching um, demand in China and Southeast Asia. And we're gonna be watching how long does COVID last? And does the Biden administration wanna keep using the food box program, which is heavily skewed towards dairy? Or do they wanna move more back towards increasing SNAP expenditures, which will also increase dairy consumption, but it won't be so focused on dairy. So it won't help quite as much dairy. It will help food consumption more broadly. On the bearish side, we've got a lot of butter. Uh, consumer income isn't looking great on average because of all the out of work people. I just talked about food box versus SNAP. If anything, you know, if any, you know, I guess there's two two options that could happen, which is A, we just keep using food box, um, or B, we move back towards SNAP, which would be worse for dairy. Mexican import demand. Their demand for imports or exports from us is, is um, something to watch um, as they continue to struggle. And European Union and New Zealand have uh, significantly lower prices than we do. Um, our powders are still competitive, but our cheese and butter is not, well, our cheese in particular is not competitive at the current time. So that's going to, and in, anything that lowers the cheese prices here is obviously gonna lower overall milk prices because cheese prices drive it. Um, so with that, I think I've taken up my time.
I would be happy to, you know, chat about anything, answer any questions, anything that I wasn't clear about or you disagree with, I'd be happy to have a discussion. Sure, thanks, Chris. We have a few questions that have come in. Um, one was, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the the significant new cheese plant in Michigan, um, and that that may have a, a negative or made lower cheese prices nationally. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that will affect overall milk prices by pulling milk from class four? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good point. I, it would it should have a couple of different effects. Um, I mean, the biggest effect is going to be for them is going to be local because. Um, the Michigan guys are still getting paid a dollar fifty or more less than class three price on their um, overall um, milk check. Um, but you know that plant is once it finally gets done ramping up, which should be in the next two or three months, you're talking about eight million pounds of milk a day, making eight hundred thousand pounds of cheddar, and then accompanying um, whey products with it and. Um, so that's a going to be a significantly more cheese. Let's see. We produce about we produce just about about 1.1 billion pounds total of cheese a month. So if you produce 8 million pounds a day times 30 days, that's another 240 million pounds. Um, in percentage terms, that's not huge, is it? But I think it's enough to start to matter when you're thinking about the fresh cheese market. And you are right. Um, where that milk in, in Michigan in particular had been going was class four, right? Because the, the churns have been operating uh, big time there. And so the other thing it will do, by the way, um, is you'll stop seeing Michigan milk coming this direction, right? Or at least there should be less of it. And that's been an issue. Those, they've been looking for a home for that milk for so long, and they've been hauling it long distances, including into the Northeast in some cases, um, which has been a good thing for some people and not so good for others. <laughs> okay. Um, a question came in about uh, back when you were talking about this about the um, the the food inflation um, and the, the 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 kind of surge that we've seen recently in um, in the CPI for food. Mm -hmm. um, do you think how much of that do you think is actual food prices going up versus perhaps changes in the way we buy food like getting more food delivered that's a higher cost um, or other ways of different shopping? That's a good question. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, um, yeah, because we are talking about, so now food at home is gonna have more service um, components in it, right? Compared to what it used to be, which was food at home had basically had no service. Uh, charges is for delivery and food away from home had lots of it, right? So um, that's that's going to be something that I'm going to, we're going to be interested to dig into the data and see. That's it. So what you know, and I'm not certain how much it costs to get food delivered because I don't do that. Um, so, but but that's a really good point that I hadn't considered is that in addition to the COVID expenses. We're talking about delivery. Actually, oddly enough, I was sitting here this morning on a different meeting, uh, working in my home office, and I can see the driveway from my house. And as I'm in a, in another meeting, this van pulls up, and this guy starts unloading buckets and just a huge. He had like I don't know, um, five cases of you know soda and you know, 15 pounds of ham and. And, and I texted my wife and said, what's going on? Or do you having, you know, everybody from Cornell over or something? And she mm -hmm. went out and talked to him and, and he had the wrong address. So I'm glad we caught him before he left it all on our doorstep. But um, yeah, that's a really okay. good question. We'll have to dig into, I think it's gonna be interesting to dig into what's causing this kind of food inflation. Um, and that's a good point. Okay. and. Um... You know, I'm going to ask you to perhaps use your crystal ball again a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, there's uncertainty here, but um, how much of this change in how we're eating do you think will be permanent versus, um, you know, will go, go away quickly when COVID kind of disappears? Well, that's a really good question also. Um, I think, well, I don't know. You know what? I, I my wife is an excellent cook, and I try to do my share on some things that I can actually manage. 
Um, but man, I'm tired of eating at home. And, and I, I think at least when we can, and I, I suppose this opening is not going to happen suddenly, right? It's probably going to be that we're going to work our way kind of slowly back towards something that looks like normal. But I think there's going to be an enormous amount of pent up demand for going out. Um, hopefully there's still some restaurants that aren't chain restaurants that are around at that point. Um, yep. So, but, but there's got to be some, if you, if you look at the data, um, sales of kitchen equipment for cooking are up through the roof, which makes some sense. I think a lot of people have learned how to cook. I think there has to be some long-term residual effect of this from people. And hopefully, you know, looking at sales of whole milk being up and stuff means that more people will consider, you know, sticking with that kind of consumption pattern. But, but um, you know, geez, there's, I'd like to sit down with the guys from, you know, Kroger and Wegmans and Tops and everybody else and ask them what they think the long-term trends are. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, because, you, you know, that's going to depend on where you want to make these investments, right, long-term? Yep. So um, getting back to milk production, um, the quotas on um, New York, many New York farms were obviously offset by other farms increasing production as month to month production has still increased. Yep. Um, do you think that the quotas put on by many uh, milk buyers or cooperatives um, could perhaps put Northeast at a, at a disadvantage to other parts of the country in the long run? Well, that's a good, that's, that's a, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, it's, I think the Northeast was kind of did it more uniformly than other regions did. It, it's possible it puts you at a disadvantage, but I don't, I think, you know, there's bigger issues like the labor uh, rules um, and some things like that. Um, I think the co-ops in the Northeast have done a pretty good job of kind of tailoring it to their individual situation, which is, you know, some of them were much more draconian than others because they really needed to get that milk supply under control in the short run. Um, but I will tell you this, talking to farms, the ones that cut back milk production dramatically are the ones that are, that are the saddest about it at this point. The ones that just plowed like right through ended up doing better. But you know, that's one of those hindsight is 2020. At the time, you know, we thought we, this might be a long-term issue instead of kind of recovering quickly. It was hard to envision the government stepping in with five and a half billion dollars worth of food purchases when it happened, right? Because if yep. you didn't, you wouldn't have cut back. So along those lines, um, given the supply constraints that some cooperatives put in place, um, how do we explain uh, that year-over-year -year milk production is up so much in the Northeast still? Do we think that those restrictions were not uh, were more patchwork than we uh, imagined, or or if some eased those restrictions? Well, a lot of them, the restrictions really only had a lot of bite for a month or two, and then they eased them. Um, but that's not uniform across all different. That's that's a that's a good point, right? So, and a lot of those programs are still on the books, and they could be brought back in if they needed to. That might be a, a bigger deal as what is the long term kind of legacy effects of those programs? Because now that you have them, does that mean it's easier to put them in next time? And if we keep seeing milk production growing at three percent. Are they likely to kind of because they're still on the books, but you might have zero penalty, right? And so you could announce, hey, tomorrow um, the penalty goes to five dollars a hundred way, and and so, um, but but yeah, that's uh, you know I think you've got a good point. What are the competitive implications of this? A from between one cooperative and another, and B between the different regions, um, because you know there's there's still milk that would come in and meet the demand from outside. If, we don't keep doing it here. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say, you know, my experience is this part of the country, the dairy industry is a lot more entrepreneurial in coming up with new products and, and, and working to meet the demand than like um, the upper Midwest, which is much more, we'll make um, commodity cheese and butter. But, you know, that's just kind of what it seems like from my point of view. Yeah. Um any other thoughts about um, international trade uh, in terms of the outlook for 2021? Um, do you see some of the trade 
you know, trade disputes that we've had in the past easing. Um, do you think Brexit's going to have a any kind of effect at all, really, um, with the, with EU exports? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, you know, I, I think it seems logical to me that the Biden administration would look to enter the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, because they basically, when we finished the Obama administration, it was all set up for us to join the TPP, right? Um, and then we pulled out. And, and then what we did was basically make a deal with Canada that got us basically the same deal in Canada. But there's some other countries like Japan and stuff where we don't have as good a deal as we could have had under TPP. So if we can kind of get back into TPP, I think that would be a good thing um, for dairy in particular. Um, get, get us into a few more Pacific countries and get us on this, at least on equal footing with New Zealand into Japan. Um, so that's that would be good. Brexit, man. Um, but Brexit is just a big mess uh, for Great Britain right now. Um, yeah, that's going to definitely affect um, some of our trade agreements going forward. But I, I think the bigger deal is looking looking at the Pacific right now. Okay. Um, and we're we're approaching the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of people's time, but. Um... We'll just have, have a you know a couple more quick questions. Um, one is that 2020 obviously was known as the year of COVID. Um, for dairy, it was also known as the year of the negative PPD. Um, what do you see happening with that going forward? Do you think that the negative PPDs will decrease in importance as class four comes closer to parity with class three? Or do you have any outlook on that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, there were several factors that drove the negative PPDs in 2020. Um, the biggest one was the, the spread between class three and class four because, uh, well, for a couple different reasons. One is in the Northeast, we got actually a fairly well balanced portfolio across the across the different class uses. So, um, you know, uh, and in fact, more class two than virtually anybody else. And class two prices are priced off of class four. So anytime class four prices are relatively low, that also means class two prices are relatively low. And then the other thing is we, we changed um, about two years ago, uh, May of 2019, pricing class one off of, instead of being the higher of class three or class four, to just pricing it off of the average of class three and class four plus 74 cents. So when, when we have particularly low class four prices, it, it hits it several dip relative to class three. It has several negative effects there. And then there was the depooling, which was a big deal and actually mattered in the Northeast, but mattered a whole lot more out West. Because um, actually the Northeast has has the tightest pooling rules uh, of any of the, of the multiple component orders. Anyway, I think it's at the top of the national milk um, agenda is to do something about this, uh, the PPDs. And I, you know, I think one thing that they're going to look real hard at is trying to make to change that class one pricing instead of being the average of class three and class four plus 74 cents um, to maybe um, snub it. So it, if there's a difference between class three and class four, that's, you know, bigger than a dollar fifty, a hundred weight or some trigger like that, that they're going to snub it and not let it go lower than that. And that should help offset that difference. Also, like we discussed, if, if class three and class four prices converge a bit, but I think we're also going to have a discussion about pooling rules. Um, and all of that is going to be on the agenda, potentially when we have discussions about federal milk marketing orders, which I think a lot of people are ready to have those discussions. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. This was really useful information and very informative. Um, we're at uh, we're a little bit over two o'clock, so I'm going to I'm going to sign off now. There's a couple of questions we weren't able to get to, but we will follow up with those people. And um, with that, I uh, thank everyone for their time. Any final thoughts, Chris? No, you know what? Thanks for having me. If there's something in particular you want to discuss, I'm happy to discuss it. You know, feel free to drop me a line. And uh, thanks for having me, you guys. Okay, thank you very much.